Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and for all the skepticism about there ever being a resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We all feel that it would be wonderful if there were bridges of understanding between the Palestinian and Israeli community. By the way, many of us, many of us who've had experience with Palestinians know we have met lovely, caring people. So one can only applaud any attempt to build those bridges between Palestinians and Israelis, between Muslims and Jews. And on this edition of L'Chaim, I have the pleasure of sitting with two individuals, one a Muslim and one a Jew, who are seeking to do just that in a most unique and creative way through comedy. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Yegane Mahar, and Eitan Levine, a comedy duo known as Shalom Habibi, which means Shalom, or hello, dear friend, in both Hebrew and in Arabic. Let me tell you a little bit about Yegene and Eitan. Yegene was born in Iran. Her father is Muslim, her mother is Christian. Yegene's family moved to the United States when she was six years old. And then at 17, Yegene came to the Big Apple to pursue a career in comedy. Yegene is now a regular performer in comedy clubs all over, including New York Comedy Club and Eastville. And Yegene is an active member of the Muslim Otherhood, an artistic comedy movement. Eitan Levine is a graduate of Yeshiva University, is a New York-based writer and comedian, Eitan has been a producer with Ali Daily, Cheddar, Mashable, and several other publications. And as a writer for Hollywood Says, he worked for the celebrity talk show filmed in the U.S. by China. It is such a pleasure to have you, but now that I've met you before this you know, taping began, it is really a joy to have you. You are both legitimately funny and it's a craft, you're both good at it, and it's a real honor to have you here on this, at this table for L'Chaim. I want to get a recording of you saying my credits and complimenting me, and just listen to it before I go to bed every night, because this is, I am on an ego high right you now. You get to like the gates of hell, and yeah. you're like, but listen to this. What are you talking about? You see this JBS profile? <laughs> have you seen this rabbi be nice to me that one time? Cool it, Satan! <laughs> You know, by the way, this is now a podcast. You can listen to it at night. Oh, my God. There we go. There you you go. thought of everything. <laughs> okay. You're going to want to start with you. <clears throat> First of all, you were brought up in a home where your father was Muslim, your mother was Christian. What was that like? Um, so people think it's a lot more dramatic than it was. I was like a kid obsessed with religion, so I was consistently always like, if God made us, who made God? And they were both like, we both don't fully know the answer. Uh, so a lot of the questions that like kids have that they bring up, like what's hell? They would have like the same relative answers, whereas opposed to Christianity, it's like one defining thing is that Jesus is God's son. So that would always be like a little, eh, like do we bring that up into it? But other than that, it's a lot of the same stories, and especially when you're a kid, things seem like a fairy tale. So the way they would work together is just like finding the similarities and we wouldn't necessarily talk about Jesus a lot, but we would talk about like the pre-Jesus stories. And they're basically the same. Chris, are you an only child? I was actually, so my name means only one unique. I was supposed to be an only child. For nine years I was. I have a little sister, but I was brought up, I have only child tendencies. Okay, so for a long time you were the only child yeah. in your family. Okay, did your parents get along well? No. But I, I don't think that was just religious standpoints. Yes. <laughs> um, I think they didn't make it about that when they were arguing. Okay. Um, if they didn't get along well, was that hard on you as a child? No. I'm a 
I'm a person that like likes arguing, so I didn't like get devastated when that was happening. I was like, Mom, you should yell. <laughs> so I didn't really care. Okay. Did you go to a mosque? I have gone to mosque. Have you, did you go to a church? I go to church every Sunday. You still do? Yeah. Okay. Do you self-identify self more as a Christian than a Muslim? Uh... I don't know. All my tattoos are Islamic, but I go to church every Sunday. <laughs> Good job. Uh, so what does that apart that <laughs> sentence? What, what, what does that say? I think I it's hard. I think my belief systems are way more Islamic, but my rituals are more Christian. There's a there's a writer Reza Aslan and he once said that Christianity is like a philosophy and Islam is like a religion, and I kind of live by that where it's if I'm going by morals, I live by Islamic morals, like I won't eat pork, whatever you might say, like those specific rules. But if I'm going by philosophy, I'll go by Christian tendencies of like, be kind to thy neighbor, stuff like that. So I feel like it is split. And That's I, interesting. Yeah, I feel like I live a philosophy of Christianity and a principle of Islam. Okay. Are you suggesting, by the way, that Christianity has a softer tone than Islam? 110,000 <laughs> percent. So without going into detail, What's the essence of the difference, of the tone okay. between Christianity and Islam? We actually had a comic that was on our show that said something where he's like, uh, a bad Muslim is still going to get into the best Christian heaven. And I thought that wow. was very funny. It's problematic, I understand. But mm -hmm. it, truly, it's um, the way, the Quran is a, like this thick. The Bible's like this thick. You can find leeway in a book that's this thick. You can't find your way out of something when it's this big. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes. you can go into the Bible saying, I want to do this. I know it's a sin, but there's so many pages. I'm going to find my way to work it out. And whereas in the Quran, it's like, do not do this. Page two, over. You're not going to find it mentioned again. Whereas the Bible has references and al allegories and, like, different things and themes in it. Whereas the Quran is like, this is the story of Abraham finished. This is the story of Moses finished. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Bible, multiple people worked on it. Mm -hmm. And also the Quran is like, supposed to be God-written, whereas the Bible is multiple people-written. By the way, that's not what Eitan was taught at Yeshiva University. No, I was taught the more books, the better a Jew you are. <laughs> Were you taught that people wrote the Torah? No. I, well... <laughs> Well, no, you were. You were taught that. It, I mean, you were taught it, people wrote it from, uh, you know, but it came down from on high. Uh, you know, that, that the led, Torah. Uh, the Torah. You were taught it at Yeshiva University. No, 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 no. I, I, no, God the made the Torah. Mount Sinai Hospital. Mount Sinai Hospital. Yeah, exactly. No, Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm, gave the large, the I'm talking about the larger. I was the larger works and the larger canon of. Jewish, that is off true. Of Abs the, absolutely. Off of that great oh, wait, Jewish that's joke interesting. I was making. Are you aware that in the Jewish tradition there is this enormous corpus? of rabbinic literature that has been written based on Torah, but it is created by the Jewish people. Is there something similar in Islam? There's a lot of similarities. There's, um, there's, so that's like kind of the difference between Sunni and Shia, and also living by morals that Muhammad created and certain like references to that. Um, and there's also like large groups in Egypt right now that are rewriting a lot of stuff and making it more modern because translations are pretty rare. And also it's the newest book, so there hasn't been a lot of translation because the language has remained the same, but it's not the same. It's not the same as like creating an entirely okay. new philosophy or book. Igene, what were you taught about Jews as a <clears throat> child growing up both in an Islam, with an Islamic father and a Christian mother? Um, well, I also grew up partially in Iran. And you don't know. So your first seven years. Yeah. You were very young. Six years, actually. Six so years. So less. Yeah. I was not old enough to like process information, but it's still the general vibe of like, I, I wouldn't say necessarily anti-Jew was anti-Israeli. So there was like. You wouldn't? It wasn't anti-Jew because there's Persian Jews. So Persian Jews are okay. It was like an anti-Israel. Were the Persian Jews safe and everything yeah. in there? So Persian Jews are very different from like converts. Because if you convert, they're like, oh, so you're a spy for Israel. That makes sense. The undertone was an anti-Jew because it's like, that's a religious text and that people believe by what the Torah says. And it's very similar to what the Quran believes as well. So it's not an anti-religion thing as much as it is an anti-Israeli. Okay. And have you heard people refer to this passage in the Quran that talks about the trees are being told, to, trees and rocks should move to expose the Jews that are behind them? Uh, there's also a verse in the Quran that says um, God will forgive Christians and Jews because we're all in the same. So, I mean, 
there's bats and everything. Okay. All right. Oh. Um, we are, I, yeah, don't we talk about like, killing Philistines and everything <laughs> in, in, in the Torah? I, there's yeah. also a translation thing that has to go into it, too. I don't know. It's just... I think so many of the books were also written so long ago. These were actual problems they had to solve at the time that were not problems now. Yeah, people yeah. kind of so, spoke in riddle. Like, I yeah. only care about what you were taught. I was yeah. never taught that, no. I, I was never taught anything anti-Jew. I was taught to like study all forms of text and study... I mean, especially with my parents being two religions, they didn't necessarily say you can only do these two things. It was like we had Buddhist books, we had everything. So it was never an anti-religion thing. I was taught to always educate myself on everything. The anti-anything would have been just Israel itself. Very good. As a okay. Country. At some point, you go to school, then you decide to come to New York to be a comedian. Yeah. How did that happen? Um... <laughs> well, I always wanted to be a comedian. I had been like doing stuff in the Bay Area since I was like 15 or 16, so that was never like a surprise to anyone. And I had always been in like theater, leadership, all those things, so people relatively knew I wasn't going to pursue like a medical degree. Uh, and then I went to Parsons, so that was like my excuse to come to New York. Very nice. And then that's the design school, fashion yeah. design. Yeah. And then very shortly, I dropped out. <laughs> okay. <Very laughs> I was nice. like, I cannot put up with this. <laughs> um, and you, you, by the way, you've already had some success as a real comedian. You've, you've built something very nice for yourself. Thanks. Yeah. How, you know, a lot of times, parents are not happy when their children go into any aspect of entertainment. Yeah. How did your parents feel, one a Muslim, one a Christian, about their daughter? Both Iranian, yeah. Um, both Iranian, wanting to choose not a professional career. You want to be a comic um, well, this doesn't help our stereotype that we're all like lying spies, but he, uh, my parents are very good lying spies. Uh, <laughs> none of my family knows I dropped out except them, and they've kept it that way. They don't want so people to know. They never even knew I went to Parsons. They They're told big JBS fans. So uh, it's me. <laughs> um, no, they uh, they never even knew I went to Parsons. They thought I went to NYU for journalism. Interesting. So the lie was already created when I moved to New York. Um, when I dropped out, they would um, they were like, you can't tell anyone. Some of my family lives in Australia. When I went there, they were asking me about how NYU is and stuff like that. They've created a complete bubble. Okay, You're outing her. <laughs> I mean this in as serious a way as I can. Yeah. What's, how do you process this? How do you, may I ask how old you are now? 21. Right, so as a 21-year-old, how do you process the fact that your parents want to keep what you do a secret so much they will create a sort of a fantasy life for you mm -hmm. with other members of your family. How do you deal with that? Um, I don't take it well. I think, well, when Shalom Habibi happened, my mom was like, I always believed in you, and I lashed out. And I was like, you have to, I have to remind myself I'm not like a teenager, and I can't lash out like that. But at the same time, it's like an adult problem, <laughs> I suppose. Was she angry at you for doing Shalom Habibi? No, she was very proud. Ah. Uh, she was... Uh, telling me she's so proud of me, she always knew I could do something like that, and I'm like... Because it was socially constructive. It was socially constructive, but also, uh, I don't know. I think she, at that point, she felt bad for knocking it down so many I times. I see, I see. Um, I cannot imagine your parents not being enormously proud of you. Oh, thank you. Both in terms of what you've done professionally, and also who you are as a person. And I'm so glad to have met you. Thanks. Okay, your this turn. So nice. Oh, no. Yeah. Now we're now I get five the minutes of rebuttal. The disappointment. <laughs> so, what's your story? Oh man! I mean, I know some of it, but I want you to tell the audience. Where were you born? I was born in the Bronx. I lived in Queens for a year. And, and what kind of Jewish home did you have? Mom, Orthodox. Uh, dad's a lawyer. Mom's a nurse. I got two younger sisters uh, who are more, way more religious than I. Uh, they both live in Israel now, actually. Or one of them's about to move to Israel. Uh, okay. And yeah, I went to the Jewish. I went to the JEC, Jewish Educational Center. Uh, uh, Rep. Titus Masifta Hebrew Academy. Go Lightning! Are you speaking English anymore? You know, at some point growing up, you realize no, it's just silly sounds. I was on the Jewish date. I was on the floor hockey team there, so I got. I was really Jewish. Uh, I then uh, went to. I was so Jewish that I worked in the Kushner camp in West Orange. You like take your shirt off from Moses. Yeah, right. from I got I got pre sixty seven borders <laughs> tattooed right across my chest. Um, I. Oh, wait, we yeah. should we should clarify. You don't have any tattoos. Do you? No, no tattoos. Any <laughs> bubbies no, out the there? No, the cemetery will take him. No, I can, go, I can get buried wherever any shotguns and matchmakers out there. 
Uh, I, this is Matchmakers? Pri primarily Shalom Habibi has been about trying to get me married. I think that's yeah. what my, my mom's primary uh, concern has been with this. But yeah. continue your story. Okay, so you're yeah, from Modern Earth House yeah. home, two younger daughters, two sisters, younger, yeah, sisters. sisters. And, and I was in Jewish well, you, school. Um, I went to Israel for a year. Wait a minute. Oh. I want to know the, <laughs> te the texture of your Jewish home and whether yeah. you enjoyed it. Yeah, I, Judaism has always been an interesting thing to me because I've always liked Judaism as a culture, but society, the community has not always been a great place to be. What do you myself. like most about Judaism? I, I mean, I like the ritual part of it. Like, I do believe in God. I do, I like, I believe in a lot of this stuff. I think that the Torah, however, it was built as a, as a fluid document. And I think that at some point, for a lot of political and societal reasons, the fluidity concept of it got halted and uh, leaders at the top of the institutions don't let it move past where it is or where it has been for years. And it, you know, and it doesn't match what I think the community and what the larger world is right now, mm -hmm. which is a problem. I think that it leads to a lot of like a straight up bigotry and you know, it, the community can be such an unfriendly place. And it's so, what is hurtful about that is that Judy's himself is not a damaging, hurtful thing. And the good parts of the Torah and the good parts of Judaism have made the Jewish community do such great stuff. But then there is like such dark clouds because the LGBT community is still very much you know, pushed to the side. Islamophobia, honestly, like racism is an issue that doesn't get addressed enough. These are all issues that don't progress forward. And a lot of that is, and it's all society based. It's, okay. There's nothing to do with the Torah. Okay. I want to come back to that. Yeah. I want to know. You seem to make reference. I want to clarify. Also, yeah. are you less observant now than you once were? Yeah, I, I am. I, yeah, I'm, I am less observant now. But I will say, I just, I threw it off completely for a while, and then because of the society part of it, because I didn't want to be in the community anymore, because I did not feel welcome. I didn't feel like the community was a good place to be. Um, but then I'd say, like over the past like two and a half, three, probably like two and a half, probably closer to two and a half, two years, I've come back to the religion in my own personal ways that mm -hmm. have I've found meaning and you know I, I found whatever meaning and whatever else in uh, that have not been community based and I think a lot of that in, in a weird way comedy and identifying as like a Jew ha comedy has helped me identify as a Jew a lot more I think in a lot of ways in what way because like this, okay, the synagogue shooting. I, I stopped doing stand-up for a while, and then I got back into it a couple of years ago. And it happened, I'd say, six months before the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting. And I remember when the synagogue shooting happened, the, literally the first thing that I did was I sat down and started writing jokes about anti-Semites and, like, anti-Semitism. And one of the first jokes I wrote was about, like, how neo-Nazis are so stupid, but at the same time, their symbol, the swastika, it's so hard to draw. That's why anytime you see a swastika printed on a synagogue, there's always like four or five deformed swastika attempts make its way up to the main swastika as if neo-Nazis show up and they're just like, ah, the Jews will not replace us. Damn it, okay, the Jews will not replace us. Where's the stencil? You know, like, stuff like, you know, like that You're came sick. out. It literally, like, six, <laughs> seven, like, I have a joke about nine, like, you gotta believe in weird conspiracies if you're an anti-Semite. Like that the Jews did 9-11. Like the Jews did not do 9-11. If we did 9-11, we wouldn't shut up about it. If we did 9-11, every single Jewish mother would be like, remember 9-11? It's Miriam Eppelman's grandson. He did 9-11. What have you done? You know, and like that comes from, it's such a, a horrible, it, 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 the basis for that joke is that neo-Nazis broke, a, 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 a guy who hates Jews and was influenced by neo-Nazi rhetoric shot up a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and I, why my rationalization or why the way that I've emotionally dealt with you know, my ties to Judaism and my ties to the anti-Semitism rides has been through joke writing. And, and because of that, this made me reflect on the non-joke elements of Judaism in a lot of ways. And That's I think that it's fascinating. You know, it's, it's been a fuller experience, and okay. I think a lot of it has been going away from the community, has enabled me to grow into my own Judaism. And now, you know, like I'm more comfortable in the community when I have to be in the community versus before I would not ever. Can like, I, uh, you know, I just want to add that's like such a good reference to what he was saying. It's so easy to scare, but it's not as easy to make people laugh. And I just felt like yeah. very much related to that when we like almost went to war with Iran. Like my first thought was like, oh, this is so sad. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I just like relate to that concept. You went to Yeshiva University. Yeah. 
Um, what did, was that experience? I did not like, like it. I think Yeshiva University is an awful institution. I, I truly, truly <sighs> think that Yeshiva University prevents, is one of the main institutions that prevent Judaism from progressing in any, in any serious way. I think that the Rabbi Berman at the top is, an, is, a, is, a, is a homophobe, straight up. I think that he makes the lives of the LGBTQ community on campus like, I don't know how else to say this except for the fact that there are proven, uh, there are proven studies that the suicide rate amongst teens, LGBTQ teens, skyrockets under institutions and when leaders are homophobic. Rabbi Berman prevents LGBTQ communities from being formed at Yeshiva University. He has been, he's the president of the, one of the biggest modern Orthodox institutions in the world, and he refuses to let Jews who are gay be considered part of the community. That is not something new. That's happened for years. There was, when I was on campus, there was a big thing uh, when they had like a, a, it was gay person in the Mono World event that, came, that happened on campus. And there were great rabbis that came out and did support it. But at the same time, the upper part of it, uh, the upper part of the institution prevent this stuff from happening. So I do think that Yeshiva University is an awful place. I don't think that it has any place in, in, in modern orthodoxy unless it is changed completely. I think either that or they just call themselves a right-wing yeshiva institution and leave it at that, but it, it, it's not a good place. Well, you didn't have a good experience there. Personally, I didn't have a good experience, but I was not alone. I also, I mean... From one to 10, like an eight? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, it, it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I had my own issues with it, but like in retrospect, you know, like I'm not, a, I, you know, like I, I'm a straight person. Did it do you know? damage to you? It. It shook my it shook my uh, view of the community in a lot of ways. Of the Jewish community. Yes, I, I went into the to Yeshiva University, and it didn't help that I worked at the Orthodox Union right after, also, which was a whole other story. But you know, like walk into when you're in college, you're learning about the rest of the world, yeah. especially for someone that came from like a modern Orthodox Jewish day school. Like I, you know, it's a bubble. There's a bubble there. I understand why the bubble's there. I also understand I'm in high school, so like how big could my life outside of the bubble be? So when you go into college, you start learning about other communities, and you start learning about how institutions like Yeshiva University are not helping the problem at all. So I think as I became more aware to larger society, I become aware of the problems within the Jewish community and those problems. And I should also point out, there are great things in the Jewish community. I'm not saying the Jewish community is an awful place through and through, but there are massive blind spots that are never addressed. Okay. And there are also... Fabulous aspect. To oh, the a thousand percent. Yes. I'm a cancer survivor. You know who the you know where the the, I, the best place to be suffering for cancer you know is in the Jewish community. I, I, because because uh, no matter what, it's such a weird it's such a weird statement. But like you know, anytime anytime carpool needed to be done, but I was in the hospital, someone at the shul did it. Anytime meals needed to be my sisters needed to be picked up from school, some from the, the my school, some it, it was always handled. The Jewish community always handled this stuff. The Jewish community are charitable people. They're nice, charitable people who want to do well. Yeah. Now, at, you obviously, you know, Yegane was, was interested in comedy yeah. even before she came to New York. At what point do you become interested in comedy? Yeah. And how has that developed? And, you know, I ran well, some, some of the things you've done. Is The journalism is honest, isn't it? Yeah. Honest? Yeah, Hon okay. Yeah. So you are both, in some way, you've been a journalist, a theatrical producer of sorts, yeah. and... A comic. Yeah, I describe to us how did that happen to you? <laughs> All by accident. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I've been. I've, I think I've towed the line of being like a comic and journalist like pretty well over the past. Uh, I, my entire career has has been that. I I started doing stand up and then after college I um, started getting writing jobs and everything like that. Um, and I, I started writing for news. I think my career started taking off when I got to Elite Daily, which was like a. a a, a digital media site where I was covering Kardashian news. So I'd write like a lot of articles about the Kardashians. Uh, and that enabled me, and those articles became very, very big hits and very successful. And I wrote like conspiracy theories about the Kardashians. Can I blow your mind about the Kardashians? You ready for this? Everything bad that has happened to the Kardashians, where's, which camera do I look to to go You're down exactly the right. You're exactly right. Everything bad that has happened to the Kardashians in the past seven years has happened in the last week of September or the first two weeks of October. High holidays? Yeah, they did it because that's when alternate side of the street parking is in an effect in Borough Park. <laughs> it's the exact reason why. There are never more than two Kardashians trending at once. That's a fact. 
there's things like that. The the robbery, Paris robbery happened. Was that it was real? an inside job. It was Wait, a big it was? Inside job. Yeah. The, the limousine guy got orders from someone up top. The Kardashians are a conspiracy. But I used to cover articles like that. So and that that uh, those articles took off. That eventually enabled me to go to the video team. When I was working with the video team, uh, I did two one-off uh, videos with them. They were just quick things that took off, and they did a three-part documentary series on me um, where I did three weird jobs. The first job that I was that I embedded in the paparazzi in L.A. for a week, which was uh, terrifying <laughs> in so many ways. We got on a high-speed car chase with uh, Cara Delevingne outside of Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, we, right. Yeah. Me too. It was, we've all done it. We've all got on <laughs> a high-speed car chase with Cara Delevingne. Uh, a, a a real winter from a modern family. We ended up chasing her also, and uh, it was. It I went to a party with her there. Oh, I was probably sitting outside, just like waiting for her to leave so I could take a picture. Um, the second thing was I was in Ringling Brothers Circus for a couple of days, uh, and I got to perform in the Stable Center. And then the third you one fat was when you did that. And it was. <laughs> I also lost three hundred. I lost one hundred thirty pounds. Like, are you I'm, kidding? I'm, swear to God, cue it up. I'm Aton Levine, and I'm in the circus. Or what should I say? Just like. What exactly do you want me to say? No, 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 no. How'd you lose the pounds? Uh, well, I was a cancer survivor, so I- What kind of cancer? I had a huing sarcoma, I had a, a, a tumor right under my knee, basically, and they took it out, and there was a lot of like maintenance that was done, but- How are you now? I'm fine, cancer free, walking free, um, you know, stingle. <laughs> so, let's figure that out, JBS. <laughs> Bobby's at home, atonlevine.com. There is a contact form there. Send your daughters. Uh, <laughs> what are we talking about? Cancer. Uh, no, we're talking about how you got into comedy. Oh, comedy. Oh, but okay. the, oh, the, the, lost the weight. Okay, so I, I was I was, so I was a head writer for the first English talk show in China a couple years ago, and that was... Head writer. Head writer. How'd that happen? Can't speak a lick of Chinese. How'd that happen? Because I, of my entertainment journalism stuff, they were like, we need an entertainment expert. So I get called in, and I go to this network, no one knows English there. So I am writing, essentially, uh, I would go in there and they, it, they would try to have the conversation in English. Uh, so it would always be five minutes in English and then 15 minutes in Chinese where they would start talking about each other. Either they'd be talking, I would have no idea what was happening. Um, so when I came back from China, from the Chinese thing, I, all I'd been doing was eating and smoking pot in LA, so I had ballooned to 322. And my doctor was like, you're a cancer survivor. You're 322 pounds. You can't be both these things. So I lost 50 pounds, and I had the surgery to turn my stomach into a, a little banana, I think is what it is. And now I look like Natalie Portman. How do you feel? Great. Wonderful. Uh, always anxious. OK. <laughs> That's something we bonded over. Yes. So I asked, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I asked you again, I'm asking Comedy. you, how did your parents feel about your choosing this kind of career? They are supportive, but very nervous about money and then which is the most understandable absolutely way that they can be and i understand and totally get it the only time yeah <laughs> all right yeah so how does shalom habibi come to be where did where, how did you meet each other and then how did you have the idea mm. of doing a duo Yes. Well, we met each other in his apartment. Yes. I had a five-day comedy festival in my apartment called Apartment Fest. It was how almost... How big your apartment? Uh, enough to almost get me evicted. <laughs> Let me tell you. It Seriously, was, how, how we, many we people We could put 20 people in there, basically. 20 people. Yes. We had 135 comics apply to perform my apartment. And then when I got the number, I was able to go to like uh, to get sponsors. So we actually got sponsored by Dose, Google Cookie Joe, uh, oh, Heat and His Hot Sauce. Fabulous! I know it was a whole big thing. Uh, so that was that was Apartment Fest. Uh, but Yegane was one of the comics who applied to be in Apartment Fest, and she got in uh, to Apartment Fest, and uh, that was the first time we had ever met. Okay, it and was very funny. It was why had she she was. Selected. You were funny. Yes. Thanks. Do you yes. remember your routine? It was so long ago, it was like a year. You, there's one joke though from. He <laughs> loves my 9/11 joke. There's What's a, your 9/11 joke? <laughs> I haven't. I don't even do it anymore, but I used to do it, and it's a true story. It's basically that I was going through the subway turnstile, and I saw a homeless guy going under, and I felt bad for him, so I opened the door, and I was like, "Come with me." He was like, "I don't want help from a person of your color," and I was like, "All right, whatever." So we're walking away. He starts chasing me, and he screams, "You did 9/11!" It's like I was three. <laughs> Would have been so cute, <laughs> and yeah, that's he loved that. I, that was a hilarious show. I think that that's like gets to the crux. Is it of, a true story? Yeah. It sounds upsetting to me. I don't mind it. How come? My bio on Instagram is Arabic. Most people don't know it says um, grandson of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> I don't mind. Which is a joke. 
No, it's um my biological. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I wish. She got a 23, a very revealing 23. Yeah, like, it's just a picture of Saddam Hussein popped up. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Um, I don't mind it. It's like, uh, why would, I... It personally doesn't hurt my feelings okay. when people do that kind of thing to me. Okay. Whose idea? Who said to whom? Hey, maybe we should team up. We were, we were on a subway after a show one night. We were just talking, and then someone said, you know, oh, like, we should do, like, a Jewish, Arab, Muslim kind of show. And then... You both oh, like my God. Have. Yeah, no, one of my friends was like, you should have a podcast with Eitan. And I was like, oh, that would be fascinating because, like, we're Jewish and Iranian and all these things that go into it. And then we were like, wait, it should be more than a podcast. It yeah. should be, like, a show. Yeah. We were like... Let's just make it bigger. So then, I mean, the same thing with Apartment Fest. It was, I, I have a, a, a formula that I use whenever when I do comedy, bigger projects. You know, it's like come up with a, a hook, get a, a name for it that's good, come up with a logo, and then, you know, figure out a way to implement everything. And we approached the JCC. Um, so after, the, after we had the idea for this show, then it was um, figuring out, like, a venue and seeing, like, if, there's a vi if this is a viable concept. Because yes. at the time, you know, it's a question. It's still a question. Until something, until the night of a show, you don't know if the concept is viable. So we approached JCC of Manhattan, who I, last year, uh, maybe you saw this. I don't know if you did, but there was a, a video that was, like, a Passover. It was, like, a trailer for your Passover Seder that uh, the JCC of Manhattan put out. And I wrote and directed it through a company, which is how I got connected to them. So I had a relationship with them already. So... I approached them with the idea of doing, you know, of having our kickoff event or having just like doing a show at the JCC. And they were happy to do it. Yeah, they were very, JCC from the moment we brought this to them, they were like, oh, we love this idea. Mm -hmm. And that was the first indication that there was, you know, uh, that we could do something like this. We oversold. It was crazy. 230 people. And so what is it? I mean, if I were in the audience, what would I see the two of you do? You would see us um, hosting and then you would see three um, Muslim identifying people and three Jewish identity. Two to three. Two to three. Yes. I apologize. It's, it's f well, it's four to six comics. Half the lineup is Jewish. Half the lineup is Arab or Muslim. Or if there's, like, some combination, if someone has that, like, genealogy. Okay. You know. And is there something unique to either the Arabic or the Jew? Or is it just, it's just funny? Well, it's more than that because I think if there's, like, a, if there, there are other Jewish Arab Muslim shows out there, we know that. But the component that we added was the podcast discussion, which I think is where... I think that that's almost the most important part of this thing is, you know, stand up, you're up there alone, you're, you know, you're, with, you're bonding with the audience or whatever, but the actual discussion and the actual merging, ugh, merging of the minds, yeah, I hate that phrase, but like, you know, like the actual sitting down and talking face to face and, you know, learning about, uh, you know, what uh, other, what the other comics from Not Your Demographic are going through, that's where I think like the major part and the big differentiator between our show is. Okay. I also think in like New York City right now, there's a huge, like, shift going from comedy being in comedy clubs to comedy being in bars, which has allowed the producer of each show to kind of make everything very racially based. Like, you'll find there'll be a show that's, like, all Muslim people, or a show that's, like, all Asians, or all black. Like, it's that happens very often than not, because there's a huge shift happening from, oh, we're booking just, like, random comics of everything, whereas now what's selling is a very specific thing, so when you can take two specific things and bring them together, you've doubled the audience, and you've also created a diversity event. Okay. You know, by the way, on Netflix there have been a number, Netflix and Amazon have had a number of comedies that star Muslim actors, and they've been written by Muslims. And, and I'm sorry, I just am blocking, because I've watched them both, and I like them very, very much. Rami? 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 Yeah, Rami. Yeah. I love it. I, um, I actually sent a lot of my Jewish friends Rami, and they didn't love the Jewish depiction on that show. I don't know if you watched. I did. You did. So yeah. the, the Orthodox uncle. Yes. No, uh, not everyone loved that. And I think it's because a lot of the writers are Muslim. So like, I think there's room to grow within these shows as well. Absolutely. They know that. Absolutely. So I, that's also why I think this is so important. It's, you ha can't only have one religion, sorry, I spit now, no. writing a show, because if you want to touch upon life, in your life, you're not only meeting Muslims. Mm -hmm. so, I, I do think one thing that was great about Rami, though, is that... Oh, I, think I love that, that show, yeah. Yeah, what, what I do think that some, because there hasn't been much authentic Muslim content out there, I think there's something very important about showing Muslim people just existing in America mm -hmm. as, like, quirky 
you know, comedic people who are just just seeing, you know, in mosque having like conversations that are kind of silly or yeah, just. But it's them. not comedic. It's very touching. Oh, there for sure that touch. But there's a there's like a dramedy element to it. I think where there it's it's when you know when we're talking when. Ramy has a, that 9-11 episode, and Ramy is so Yeah, the personification of Osama bin Laden. Yeah, yeah, because it's about a kid going, you know, he's going through puberty. You know, if he's, everyone's all of a sudden, his life is changing all of a sudden because of this, like, terrorist attack. And he's, like, taking it to himself on a personal level because how, what else does he know of this, you know? From the religious standpoint, you know, he, his family has one uh, reaction to this. His friends have an isolation reaction to this. And there's this kid who's dealing with God and his own you know, blossoming sexuality at the same time of all of this. And it's very, it's so funny, but at the same time, it's so tough and hard to, to watch. One of the things that, that I said in the open is that you are motivated in some extent. And I want to know to what extent it is true and you know, to what percentage is it what's driving you. This idea of building bridges. To what extent is this, look, you're two comics. You're trying to create a professional career for yourselves. And you said to yourself, this might work professionally. Is it, are you driven by that more than the issue of, we see this as a way of having people of different communities. It's not simply different religions. It's really mm -hmm. different worlds. Mm -hmm. Get to know each other in a better way. To what extent is that part of what you're doing or is that ancillary to what you're doing? I think a huge thing of it is like, I had my pastor come to our show, and that's something I would not do typically if I wasn't proud of what I have to offer. Like, you wouldn't think I, I should have my Christian pastor come to a Jewish Muslim thing, but I truly, even in that sense, wanted him to see what those communities are like. I, I've experienced things even in a church that I'm like, I once was going up the stairs in my church, and they were like having discussions with security guards, and they were talking about how. In the Bible, it says that Jews are God's chosen people and how Muslims should, like, die. And they were like, Israel, Palestine, like, that's good that that's happening, all these horrible things. And this was at a church, not even, like, anywhere that should be discussing this. They were, they're, the security guards at my church were discussing. So in my head, I think people only have those kind of thoughts when they've never met a person. So the moment I stopped and was, like, like showed one of my tattoos, they were like, <laughs> like do, 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 do. let's talk about something else but I, I think it just forces you to think about it at least because it's so easy to have an idea of someone if you don't know them mm -hmm. do your pastor think I'm funny? yeah good that's funny have, of you, course met he does. have you met Jews who hate Muslims? yeah I, but I, I yeah first of all yes second of all I think that um, the Jewish community was very much representative of the entire American community post 9-11 until fairly recently. I think that um, I wasn't exposed to Muslims growing up. Um, I think probably early on that was for sure related to Israel, but after 9-11, you know, that was a bubble. We just didn't, we didn't know any people that weren't, you know, Jewish or white. I mean, we just weren't exposed to it. And I think that that isolationism from Muslims, which Did I don't you, think is the right word. Leads have to you in your life hated Muslims? Hated Muslims? No. Uh, no. Are you I think biased against them? Biased how? I don't know. Oh. I, but my problem is, and I know it sounds so like, what world do you live in? I, I meet people all the time in the Jewish world. I never hear them say anything hateful about Palestinians or Muslims. In fact, I find most people in the Jewish community mm. tend to be liberally oriented and are afraid of Islamophobia. They, they, want to, they want to make sure America doesn't go in that direction. But I have not experienced racism in the Jewish community. Oh, no, I've, no, 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 that's something. But, I've, yeah, I've experienced, I've seen like hard. Your friends, your friends, more, but like more than that, like my, you know, when I go to shul, like the older, the, uh, the men, older men, older, the, the generation above me, 100% Islamophobic uh, and to a large degree growing up. And to, the, to this day, anytime I go home for, uh, anytime I go home for something and I have to go to shul or a kiddush or everything, like I know what is being said and I know. Give me an example. There are Fox News 
Give me an example. Ta Palestinians are murderers. All Palestinians are murderers. That's not true. I think that there, there's... Are you telling me that there are people in, you, in your father's generation whom you've heard say all yeah. Palestinians are murderers? By the way... You know, it, no, because it, it, it murder, but it, it's either it's either okay, maybe not all Palestinians are murderers, but it is all Palestinians support murdering of Jews in order to to, to secure, um, in order to secu not even secure, in order to push all Jews into the sea. I think that that is a belief that the Arafat quote from years ago is still a belief that a lot of Jew that a lot of orth orthodox hardcore right wing orthodox Jews still believe in to this day when that's just not the case. Palestinians, my take on the Israeli situation has always been that Israel has every right to defend the Jewish population in Israel. Palestinians do not have a Jewish government. They don't have an equivalent. Hamas is not the equivalent to the Jewish government, in, to the Israeli government in Israel. So the Palestinians are left in the center of this. They can't leave anywhere because no countries are letting them immigrate out of that, out of, uh, you know, the Gaza uh, They're just not able to leave that. So they end up becoming caught in the crosshairs and no one is looking up for their protection. No one looks up for Palestinians in Gaza, and that is the biggest problem. So when you paint all Palestinians in Gaza as actively wanting to push Israelis into the sea, which is what I experienced a lot of the generation above me when I, you know, in synagogue at home, that's just a lie, and that leads, that, that is anti-Palestinian. It's Islamophobic. It is everything you just said. Okay. Most people I hear are sophisticated enough to make a distinction between the Palestinians, people, and the Palestinian leadership. You should check out a minion in Borough Park every once in a okay. while and Are see you saying how that, that goes. That in your world, that distinction is not made? Pick up a Five Towns Jewish Times uh, report and tell me if it doesn't read to you like Breitbart. I, I know the, the right wing, the Orthodox community, right, and non Orthodox community, one of the reasons why I have an issue with living in that community is because it is so Islamophobic and hateful. It's a bigoted group. And I think the pendulum is swinging left. And I do think that my, the, the trans issue is such a different issue, but I think like map this onto that. My grandmother has no idea what a trans person is. If I was to try to explain to her what a trans person is, it would give her an aneurysm. She would, just doesn't have the basis for it. It's my parents' generation knows what trans people are and do not like them. I don't care. I, they are people to me. My kids, they will be normal humans to them. And I think that that generational, so it is swinging more left. I think that that same level of measurement is, works for the Islamic, works for how Jews view the Islamic community. Okay. I also want to understand from your perspective, one of the things that is so troubling to so many in the Jewish community is that the Palestinians have been held hostage to a leadership that is irredentist and believes there should be no Israel anywhere, anywhere. Which is a huge in, problem. Yes, it's a huge problem. But if you grow up in a system and a society and a culture where you're taught on television, in textbooks, everywhere you go, that Jews are descendants of monkeys, apes, and pigs, and that they have no, they've stole your, they stole your land. Yeah. And they have no right to be. Yeah, it's a huge problem. But the education me, system is a huge problem in yes, Gaza. Yes, unfortunately, unfortunately, tragically, many Palestinians do grow up willing to slit the throats of Jewish children as they sleep in their cribs. Yeah, for sure, but that's just, but yes, like 100%, I agree that that is a situation, but also these are not all Palestinians want that, and if the Israeli government wanted to make it easier for people in Gaza to live better, easier lives, that is 100% something they're able to do. I don't know if you watched the 60 Minutes a couple weeks ago way, about I, the... I, I want you to know, although this is not the, this is not the whole point of the problem. Yeah. I, it, it's worthy of an entire show in and of itself. Gaza is not anything done by Israel. Gaza is a self-contained community that is basically tyrannical, terrorist, and crazy. And there was no blockade when Israel first left Gaza. Gaza had every opportunity to go in any direction it wanted to. I and think that not, that sentence isn't one hundred percent accurate. Okay. It is. Okay. I think that. Can I could, say something okay. very quickly? Yes, yeah, sorry. You should have. Uh, uh, also, first of all, you should one hundred percent be the person in this conversation. Uh, you know. Uh, I think a huge thing the Western world does is create a financial situation that's difficult to get out of, and then create a scene that looks like okay. 
Iran, for instance. What the Western world does is financially collapse the people and then show them as like sheeps and pigs and like stupid people who like have nothing and are chanting death to America. People don't start chanting death to America until they're so impoverished that they're like, who took our money? And then someone's like, America, and they're like, what do we say about that? Death to America? Like, it's literally the tactic that's been used throughout history, and history just repeti keeps repeating itself, where it's like, if you take enough money away from people and tell them to do something, they'll just start listening. Do you think it's America's fault? I think it's a huge Western fault. I think even with presidents as good as Obama, there was a facade created around what was happening in reality, like the reality of the financial situation in Palestine. And like the, the thing that they're going through in the country, we will in the Western world never actually know their truth. The thing that is broadcast on, it doesn't matter if it's CNN, it doesn't matter if it's Fox, the thing that's shown to us is not what actually is happening. What is actually happening? I can only take it from the reference of living in Iran and seeing like the effects of what a sanction can do to anyone that's below the highest level of wealth. So even if you're upper middle class, those sanctions destroy your family. The amount of money it costs to even put gas into your car, the oil that you have from your own country. Like, it what is, was the goal of the sanctions? The goal of the sanctions, well the real goal that is to financially collapse Iran, but it's so that the money doesn't go towards nuclear bases, but the Iran deal with Obama was that we would get checkups at the nuclear bases, but then that was lifted. You think uh, it's okay for Iran to get a nuclear weapon? Absolutely not. I think the Iran deal was that the sanctions would be lifted and we would have access to check to make sure they're not doing that. Now we don't have access to check and they're more poor. Them being more poor doesn't mean they don't have a nuclear plant. That just means there's more poor people, the nuclear plant keep, Taking money away doesn't take money away from the nuclear plant. It takes it away from like orphans. You know what I mean? Like it's not taking it away from the government. By putting a sanction, the government's fine. The funding towards engineers and everything, like we created algebra. We always have those educated people at those plants working. The money is taken away from families. We, we're smart people. I feel like people, when you see us on the news, we're like, all right, Muhammad, where's our lamb? Like, that's Adam not. Sandler. <laughs> Adam Sandler's in Iran. Um, but that's the reality is like, we think that if we take the money away from the country, we won't get bombed. The more money we take away from a country, the angrier the country is to bomb us. And that's the same mentality that's going towards Palestine. The more we take away from them, we think, oh, then they'll stop hating us, or maybe, oh, then they'll, they'll get it. What money has been taken away from them? Not money taken away, but I mean, when Obama was in power, he vetoed almost anything that was allowing Palestinians the farmable land that they wanted, or like any access to create. Uh, I don't does know, it, I, bother, does not, it yeah. bother you that the Palestinian leadership refuses to accept the notion that there should be a Jewish state anywhere between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. I think, if, of course, the, the people in power always bother me in both sides of the situation. But the people, the human beings. And what's the chance that the human beings agree with the be, government? Either agree or would be able to change the government? I think the whole infrastructure needs to re- I, we agree on that, by the way. Yeah. I think that the, I Better think we, finish. We, uh, I just think it's difficult to put upon the belief system of a government towards the people because there's the people, no way we can go to have, every... By the way, the government has the power. The government has power, yeah. Okay, and the government is saying, under no circumstances, under no circumstances, will we make peace with Israel. There can be no Israel. That's what the leadership says right now. What do the Palestinian people think and say about a leadership that says that? I think they have no power to even change what the leadership says. I mean, in most then of... Then what would you do in that situation? If I lived in that kind no. of... No. What would, what would you do if you were God? If I was God? And it was, this is a tragedy. This is a tr human tragedy. He predicted the tragedy, though. Okay, he did say it would happen. It's not a tragedy created by the Israelis because the Israelis are ready for all kinds of compromise. And the Palestinians have one, the Palestinian leadership has one irredentist philosophy. No Jewish state anywhere from the Jordan River to the, to the Mediterranean Sea. 
What do you do with that problem? Listen, this is how Arab people negotiate. We tell you something's ten thousand dollars, and then we sell it for five. <laughs> wow. We start big, and then we go down. We're very dramatic people. I think. Wait, I think one thing though that you say is that oh, it's not it just Israel's it mean problem. You have no answer. It doesn't mean way, I have no. It's okay. Most people have no answer. No to, answer. Well, I think isn't the Great New Deal that Trump's trying to do right now to take the land to like what thirteen percent now? So it's like everything that they're being offered is like. What if you had less? Yeah. <laughs> so it's. Oh, and the Palestinians will never in a million years accept the Trump plan. Uh, was, of course not. Of course not. not. But they didn't accept the Barack plan. They didn't accept the Ehud plan. They didn't accept the UN plan. I think because that, there's like a lining under it where no, it's no, like. No, it's because they cannot. Yeah. It's they the, cannot the, take any plan because there can't be a Jewish state on once Muslim land. There cannot be a Jewish. Yeah. This isn't about a border. This isn't about how much Wait, but of the West... Can you make the same gentlemen. argument? But that's it's the same not, argument the settlers make. Not at all. Not at all. You can't put Muslims on about, the Jewish land. That's, that's the exact not true. reverse of the Bowie, thing. Hey, you I don't want, Bowie, you, you said you've been in Israel. Yeah, I lived there for okay. a Okay, are there, I mean, in, are in, there in, Muslims living on Jewish land? All yeah, over. For all, sure. Okay, okay, okay. And, by the way... Completely different the, classification. No, that's a, not at all. And there are no Jews permitted in any Arab city on the West Bank. It's Yudinra. They're not permitted. They can't fit. That's, There's no land to let them on. I think that's, no that's harping on. on one specific small thing. And, there, are and two, under, there are two philosophies here. One philosophy is... Do you think, is, do you think the Israeli government overreacts is, at all to... to I I'm think sorry. everybody overreacts. But okay, the, wait, the, that's, the, a, that's the, a good the, answer. The, though. the that's, issue is, you've got one people saying, let's share the land. Let's figure out how to share the land. You've got another people saying, no. We will not share the land. You can't be here anywhere. I think you're painting well, a situation. I am very I'm specific only describing the truth. No, you're, but you can't just I say am, I'm only describing I'm the only truth and then describe a very specific okay, okay. outlet like, of the truth. Come like, on, that's a tell, little bit, that's tell, a little bit give much. Give me an example of Palestinian leadership we're, that does not say from the river to the sea. Palestinian leadership and the Palestinians specifically are two completely different entities. But you just heard you're going to say the Palestinian people have she's, no power. She said do you that, think she's wrong? They do... Any they group have of people, no if, power. Yeah, if all of the Palestinians were to unite in one and overthrow the government, I'm sure that there is an ability, like we've seen with social media in the Arab Spring over the past couple of years, I'm sure that that is ability. However, you're asking the impossible of a people. What needs to happen is that a third party, not Israel, not America, needs to go in, remove Hamas completely, and give the Palestinians a right to, to, to govern themselves and to have any kind of agency at all. The idea that Israel doesn't prevent Gaza from becoming bigger and uh, taking out, uh, taking off certain economic stress that Israel is creating. The idea that those stresses don't exist is just not accurate. And I do think also that it is not just Israel's fault. Every single country in that region is to blame. Israel, uh, you know, percentage of who's to blame for what, that's a whole other conversation. But every single country in that region has caused this problem. And I think that is the bigger issue. Okay. I want to end by asking you this question. I understand you're, you are legitimately funny in and of yourself. The question is, to what extent is the goal that not only are you funny, but that you hope this brings a better understanding? What understanding are you hoping a Muslim who comes to your show takes away? Then I want to hear from you. What understanding do you hope a Jew who comes to your show, <laughs> takes away. Go. So I think there's two stories to answer this. The first story is that for years and years and years, I didn't know that El Nakba Day existed. I didn't know what that was. It's the you know Palestinian Day of Mourning. Uh, oh, yeah. I had no idea. And then when I, and then when I found out... It's the same out, day as... Yeah, yeah, it's the same day as Yom Yerushalayim. And so when you find no, out... No, it's that, Yom Ma'ud. No, you're correct. Yom Ma'ud. When you find that out... I, when I found that out, I think that was one of the first indicators. And I found that out years ago before this tour had ever come up. But I, I found that out because a friend of mine was Palestinian and had a Palestinian friend who mentioned this. Um, that was the first indication I had personally that was like, oh, there was more to this story than I had learned growing up. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we were at a party. I was at a, a Halloween party with Yegane, um at, at the Muslim Motherhood, which is this like, uh, actors Muslim group. Uh, and someone, a medical emergency happened, and someone yelled, is there a doctor here? And it's all Muslims, and they all put their hands up. And I was like, this is, if this isn't exactly like every Shabbat dinner I've had <laughs> at Ohay Sedek. That was you know, so that my was, story. <laughs> then that, you know. 
how, what do I hope that they take away? Well, I was very hesitant. I wrote one joke the night before where I was like, um, I took a DNA test and I found out I'm 7% Jewish, which is as big as my pinky toe, so I cut off my pinky toe. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if they'll like that. <laughs> um, but I just hope they can take away that we're not... I hope that anyone can take this away, that we're not, like, lamb-herding shepherds. <laughs> like, I just hope... Because wow. I, 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 I've said this time and time Her again. Her intern wrote that. My intern wrote that. <laughs> uh, when you turn on CNN, it shows Iranians as, like, a specific type of person. So I hope they can meet, like, someone who looks like a white woman. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> someone who's very much concerned about avocados, but also very religious. Do you know what I mean? I just hope they know there's someone in the middle that's not going to yell at them about Iran, but will if they make her angry enough. Yeah, Muslims can be white women, too. There we go. You are wonderful. I love you. I, uh, no, you are really I wish you only success <laughs> everywhere you go. Thank you. And I expect to see you one day on every television you know, comedy show, and you're going to be a huge star. Thank you. Okay? And Me? You're, my fr you're out of this you're world. You're worthless. Oh, thank you're you. out of this world. Thank you so much. And I, I, it has been wonderful meeting oh, you. Yeah. You are both funny. You're bright. You're caring. Am I going to get married? Are we gonna get I promise you, you're going to get married, Thank you. you're going to have a wonderful wife, you're going to have wonderful children, Thank and you. a wonderful life, and uh, so are you. I'll get a wife? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> he said it here. You heard it here first. Yay, we're all getting wives. We're you getting get a wives. wife. And you, get... and you have to promise to come back. Yes, for yes. sure. Yes. We you. love it. Thank you so much Thank for having us. Much. so much fun. Yegane and Eitan, comedy team of Shalom Habibi. I hope you've enjoyed meeting them on L'Chaim. They are amazing young people. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed here on this edition of L'Chanan. Please email me or write me or paste on our Facebook page or tweet me. I always love hearing from you. And remember, we now have the L'Chanan podcast. You want to hear this again? Wherever you download your podcast, go download the L'Chanan podcast and listen to any one of the programs we've done recently and some of those that we've done in the past. Like, Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.